be Recording followed in progress. through and, and made uh, adjustments to how we plan, how we train, how we ultimately will fly the mission to take advantage of what we've learned. AX-1, of course, was an extremely successful flight for us, uh, but you always learn uh, with these flights and, and uh, we're, we're excited about uh, the efficiency we're going to gain from, from many of the things that we learned from AX-1. AX-2 in its own right is going to be a very full mission for the crew. Uh, in fact, in some respects, we have to remind them occasionally that, you know, the objective is, of course, to experience the moment. Uh, given all the research they have to do, we'll have over 20 uh, research experiments, mostly applied research, which is which is why we like to fly. Uh, applied research means you're going to lead to some product or or capability that uh, will will benefit humankind, and we're excited about that uh, that focus. Uh, but also, it's a heavily uh, STEM oriented. Uh, all the crew spend quite a bit of time. Uh, talking to uh, the younger generations in schools and, and whatnot. So it'll be a very full mission, uh, even more efficient than AX-1 we're looking forward to. We have a lot of experience now uh, with both NASA and and, uh, and SpaceX. And, and uh, as I said, we're excited to be doing this again with, with both our partners uh, in this regard. This, this mission is the second in our series of full missions to the International Space Station. These are really steps for us in a process to get rid of, ready to build our inner, our, our space station. Um, and so we are learning to work efficiently and safely with NASA on orbit so that when our first module arrives and the crew uh, um, uh, takes um, habitates in the in the our module that uh, we'll, we'll be able to work efficiently efficiently with NASA. Uh, and be able to work towards a seamless transition from the International Space Station to the Axiom Space Station when, when ISS uh, is retired. So these flights are all part of the uh, exercise to make sure we're very good at uh, working together when, when, uh, when our first module shows up. And that's currently scheduled. Module 1 is scheduled to fly in 2025. Uh, then we have a second module in uh, 2026, uh, those two modules together will house up to eight crew and have two docking ports, a number of berthing ports available. Uh, and then uh, later that year, uh, we expect to see our, our research and um, and science module, which will show up, uh, which will show up and provide an exclusive uh, area to do research and, and manufacturing on orbit. So all of these flights are really stepwise approaches to, to sort of growing the economy in low Earth orbit and taking advantage of the work that's gone on ISS for the last 20 years in the in the following decade or so. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Katina. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, next, we'll hear from the commander of this mission, um, Peggy Whitson. Yeah, space is really changing right now, and I'm really excited to be a part of expanding humanity's access uh, to this amazing frontier. Um, Mike already introduced my crew, it, um, but I actually feel very uh, blessed that I have such a, an extremely talented crew that has not only met, uh, but surpassed the training requirements for this mission. Uh, as he mentioned, we've trained at NASA, SpaceX. We've also changed at the European Space Agency and the Japanese Space Agency. We've done centrifuge training, zero-G flights, uh, outdoor and confined environment training uh, to, for team building. So I really feel that that has prepared us very well. Um, John is uh, going to be the pilot, as, as Mike mentioned, and he has decades of flight experience and amazing engineering know-how. Uh, that makes him perfect for the role. Uh, he always has a story to tell to entertain everyone. So we we love his storytelling. Uh, and one of his major objectives is STEAM education. He's got an art contest planned in addition to many scientific and uh, outreach uh, uh, discussions with school children. And um, this aligns really extremely well with Ali and Rayana because their aim is to inspire the youth in their country. And Ollie, as a military pilot, brings a lot of operational and savvy discipline uh, to the mission. And he's always volunteering for additional tasks. So it's great to work with him. Uh, Ray will be the first Saudi woman to fly in space. And so obviously she has an important role as a, a role model. Uh, but her scientific background uh, in breast cancer and stem race cell, 
stem cell research is actually really important for a lot of the investigations that we're going to be conducting uh, during the mission. Um, and she has an extremely meticulous style that goes along with all that type of biomedical research. Uh, but what really is important about Rihanna is that she is this warm and inviting personality that makes her like the best crew member to fly with. Um, we have over 20 investigations, as Mike mentioned, um, everything from tumor organoids, uh, which are going to help us uh, predict and prevent cancers uh, with, with these, this knowledge that we can gain from doing these studies in, in microgravity, all the way to the technology demonstrations that we hope to build uh, uh, and use as part of Axiom Station in the future. Uh, one of the investigations I'm most interested in is an in-space manufacturing investigation, looking at how microgravity affects nanoparticle assembly of potential development of cartilage. And I don't know about everybody in the audience, but my niece could use a little of that extra matrix. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, uh, I'm really excited about the mission and uh, looking forward to answering your questions and helping you understand uh, who I'm working with uh, for this mission. Great. Um, thank you so much, Peggy. Next, we'll hear from our partners of the Saudi Space Commission. Turn it over to Michelle. Thank you so much. Good morning on your side. Good evening on our side. We're very excited and honored to be conducting our inaugural mission for our uh, first human spaceflight program uh, that is meant to be sustainable. This is a significant milestone for us in the kingdom as we launch, as everyone mentioned earlier, our first female into space, Rihanna Barnawi, and our second male, Ali al Garni, into space. Uh, this program is uh, was introduced by the Saudi Space Commission under the leadership of His Royal Highness Prince Mohammed bin Salman to ensure our contributions to science and to enable the human capital development within the space sector and to ensure that the science we do and the sci scientists and future astronauts from Saudi Arabia have impactful science that contributes to uh, so the entire body of science globally and benefits all of humanity. This will enable Space player through our partnerships, like the one we have today with Axiom, NASA, and SpaceX. Uh, we are very grateful for this partnership as we uh, develop uh, this sustainable human spaceflight program, which will pave the way for uh, long stay missions in the future. Uh, on this mission, as mentioned, obviously, the most important thing we do uh, for human spaceflight program is microgravity research and outreach, STEM outreach. Uh, from our side, the Saudi Space Commission, we are investigating 11 groundbreak, break, uh, groundbreaking microgravity experiments, and we are also ca um, capitalizing on this opportunity to have an outreach with three experiments. The three experiments are meant to engage uh, over 12,000 students across 47 different locations in Saudi, the goal of which is to uh, have them participate in this mission, as well as enlighten them and get plant the seed of curiosity in every child across Saudi, hopefully becoming future astronauts and future scientists that can uh, enable us to do missions and, uh, for uh, Mars and eventually, uh, I mean, the moon and then eventually Mars. So we are very excited about that. Uh, we are um, confident in our, our astronauts as well as the, uh, the entire crew to achieve this mission. And we're very excited because this is, uh, as I mentioned, the inaugural mission that will be for a sustainable human spaceflight program for Saudi Arabia. Thank you so much. Um, we're excited to fly with the Saudi Space Commission. Next, we're going to go to our NASA colleagues, starting with Angela Hart. Yeah, good morning, um, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are listening in. First, I wanna thank you all for being here and your continued interest in these groundbreaking breaking commercial missions to the ISS. It's great to be doing this a second time around and I'm looking forward to more missions in the future. The AX2 mission represents the continued progress that NASA and industry is making to build a robust commercial economy in low Earth orbit. Um, private astronaut missions help to stimulate the demand side of the equation of the low Earth orbit economy and our overall vision for a long-term sustainable presence in LEO with NASA astronauts working side by side with private and international astronauts. AX2 builds upon the successes of AX1, 
the more we do these kinds of missions aboard the space station, the clearer the picture becomes of how NASA and industry will work together aboard a commercial destination in the future. We recently signed an agreement with Axiom for the third private astronaut mission, and we're excited to continue these type of missions in the future. As I noted, private astronaut missions are an important part of NASA's strategy for enabling this robust economy and in order to develop customer goods and services. And we really look forward to all of the activities that are ongoing coming up on AX2. There's still lots of work ahead to execute the AX2 mission on board station, and there's a lot to look forward to watching these private astronaut missions and these astronauts on board the ISS. With that, I'll toss it back to you, Bettina, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Angela. Next, we'll have Joel Montalbano. Thank you, and thank you all for joining us today. You know, it's exciting to be here, um, you know, preparing for another private astronaut mission and to build upon what we learned on the future mission. So, as Michael said, launch time on May 8th, uh, 9.43 p.m. Houston time, so 10.43 Eastern. Uh, this crew will be docked to the International Space Station 10 days. And Michael mentioned they'll do a little over 20 research experiments um, that will result in about 130 hours of national lab science that this crew will do on board, contributing to all the national lab science that we do with our NASA and international partners on board the International Space Station. Uh, earlier this morning on board, we did a Soyuz relocation, uh, moving the Soyuz from the service module with Zenith port to the Russian node port, and that went without issues. Uh, looking forward, the Russian colleagues have scheduled the three spacewalks coming up, two in April and one in early May. On the NASA side, we have a spacewalk scheduled for April 28th, and so we're excited to, to participate in all those activities. On board again, the uh, CRS-27 or SpaceX-27 Dragon mission continues to go well. Uh, that mission will be docked 30 days with the undocking plan now for April 15th. Uh, that vehicle delivered over 6,000 pounds of investigations, crew supplies, and hardware to the International Space Station. And the team on board is fully utilizing each of those uh, pounds on board to maximize the use of the International Space Station. In closing, we're excited to, again for another mission. We're excited to have our partnership with Axiom Space. And we're looking forward to a great mission. With that, let me hand it back over to you, Bettina. Thank you, Joel. Um, and next, and, and our final speaker for, for this part of the, the press conference, Sarah Walker with SpaceX. Thanks, Joel. Thanks, Bettina. Wow, I cannot tell you how fun it is for me to be a part of this call today and see where we've come over the last decade. So in my early years at SpaceX, Mike, you were the ISS program manager, and Joel, you were his deputy. Peggy, you were a seasoned NASA astronaut, and at Angela, you were one of the leaders I interacted most with for the CRS program. I, I couldn't believe it when I saw today's lineup and realized all our hard work for the commercialization of space has, had gotten us to this moment. This is the future we dreamed of, and it's here. Last year, we launched Axiom Space's AX-1 mission to the space station, I'm sure you remember, and that completed Axiom's first human spaceflight mission and the first ever all-private astronaut mission to the International Space Station. And here we are today, prepping to launch AX-2 the first commercial mission to the station to include both private astronauts and astronauts representing foreign governments. We're proud to launch this mission on behalf of Axiom Space, who's committed to making low Earth orbit accessible to everyone. And we're excited to support this crew in particular in the research they have planned for ISS. This is a mission of multiple firsts, and we're honored to have helped train and prepare Peggy, John, Ali, and Rayana um, for their historic mission and Dragon's 10th human spaceflight mission to the ISS. As we often say, we take very seriously the responsibility that has been entrusted in us to fly crew to space and return them safely home. So my team's mission and our laser focus right now is to safely launch AX2 to the station and then return this crew to their families about 10 days later. A quick overview of the vehicles flying on this mission. This is the first launch for this Falcon 9 booster and the second flight of this Dragon spacecraft. It was named Freedom by NASA's Crew-4 who previously flew this Dragon to the space station last year actually just days after the Axiom-1 mission returned. 
Uh, the teams are completing um, Dragon's refurbishment at the at our facility at the Cape right now. They're preparing Dragon for the test drive, which is when the crew will get into their flight vehicle wearing their flight suits for the first time. It's a good moment of familiarization for the crew to mate and demate connections between suit and seat, to try out their helmet audio with comm checks and more. Afterwards, we head into nominal launch milestones, beginning with Dragon's transfer to the SpaceX hangar at Launch Complex 39A on NASA's Kennedy Space Center. So stay tuned for that at the end of the month. Thank you again for including me in today's briefing, and thanks from all of us here at SpaceX, to Axiom Space, to NASA, and to the Saudi Space Agency for your trust, partnership, and close collaboration on the AX2 launch as we all work together to make space accessible and make humanity, humanity multiplanetary. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you everyone for that status update and the overview of the priorities for the upcoming AX2 mission. Now we're gonna open the floor to reporter questions. As a reminder, if you have a question, please use the raise your hand feature on the site. And you can also submit your questions to the moderator via the chat function. We've already received a few questions from reporters and we'll take some of those during this conversation. To help move things along, please remember to state your name, affiliation, and whom you'll direct the question to. And you can also follow along the conversation on social media with the hashtag AX2. We'll begin um, with our first question um, as reporters um, ask questions on the chat feature from the Orlando Sentinel. The question is directed to Mike Sofredini. What aspects of AX2 are building on AX1 toward the end goal of building out Axiom Station? With AX3 approved, what is the company's goal in terms of missions per year, the first the first module is launched, and is there an update target year for that? Uh, let's see. Uh, in order of ask, so uh, AX2 is uh, similar to AX1 from the standpoint of how we're uh, practicing the process of working with our partners and and becoming more and more efficient working together with both spacex and nasa spacex of course for the launch and nasa for the on-orbit effort uh, as i mentioned earlier we had about uh, 200 lessons learned that we went through and this is a, a process so if you do a number of these flights uh, you figure out what you can do better next time and then you make the changes and go do the flight so ax2 is just another a step in the process from that standpoint, of course, for all the reasons we said, AX2 is a very unique and exciting flight in and of itself. Uh, we expect to fly as often as uh, as NASA has opportunities, but of course we compete for those. But our intention and preparation is to uh, fly about two flights a year uh, until our first module shows up, which is, as I mentioned, is the latter part of 2025. In which case we'll have a little more uh, access and flexibility and and uh, and we'll fly at that point we'll start to increase our tempo a little bit um, based on uh, what the customer demand is. Thank you. Our next question will come from Jeff Faust. Jeff, your line is open. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, wanted to ask for um Mike and or Peggy, you mentioned you've got a bunch of lessons learned from AX1 that you're applying to AX2. I wonder if you could give any um, specific examples of things you're doing differently on AX2 based on the experience from AX1. And also just really quickly, if you do launch on May 8th, when is the docking at the space station? Thanks. So in terms of, in terms of the lessons learned, uh, it, it's been really great working with NASA to come up with how to optimize our training based on our lessons learned. So um, we we felt like uh, the training needed to be improved and increased in certain areas and decreased in other areas that would optimize for our mission tasks and mission objectives. And with NASA, we have uh, modified the training and made those suggestions. Um, it's been amazing. Uh, the changes that NASA has made to optimize that. And I really feel our crew, uh, based on our simulations, additional simulations, which we had requested, uh, have really shown and proven that to be the case. Uh, in terms of launch to docking time, I think... So, so, I've got yeah, that one, Peggy. Okay. Go ahead, Sarah. 
so funny enough, um, so if we launch on 5-8, uh, we would dock on 5-10 uh, at 11.40 a.m. Eastern time. That's about a 37-hour flight. Uh, funny enough, if we launch the, the following opportunity, we actually arrive uh, at the same time, <laughs> just based on the trajectories and, and how they worked out. Um, but yes, uh, so 5-10 docking. Great, thank you so much. Um, we'll take next question. We have someone from, we have a question from Aviation Week from Mike Corot. Could you review the training process for each private astronaut? Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Just checking. Um, uh, so the 30 astronauts came in uh, last fall and we have trained them as I mentioned, uh, initially we did zero G training on a um, zero G flight and then did uh, centrifuge training to simulate the launch and, and entry loads and launch escape loads that they would experience. Uh, we did a, a national outdoor leadership training experience. And then we also got an opportunity to do a HERA experience at at uh, the Johnson Space Center facility where it was a confined uh, arrangement, a very small location, and we got to work together for five days. So through all those experiences, uh, we have really prepared, I think, a good team. Um, do you have any other specifics of the questions you'd like to have answered? Well, that, that question came in written, but I think that you did a, yeah. a great job. I know that a lot of things you have told me is how the difference is of focusing this training specifically on what they need to accomplish for this mission to ensure success. Yes, yes. Great, thank you so much. Um, our next question will go to Rowan Radan from Arab News. Hi, good evening, and uh, it's Rawan Radwan from Arab News, uh, Saudi Arabia's leading English daily newspaper. My question, um, I'd like to ask a question to Masha Ali Shimamri uh, from the Saudi Space Station and for engineers at the at Axiom as well. Um, given the, the timing um, and the, the the space, the, the amount of time the, the astronauts have been trained, it's different from the typical NASA astronauts being trained these days. Um, what can we see within and when they when they fly in May and it's a ten day mission? What can we see different from the astronauts that have been trained for years and uh, staying at the space station for 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 an increased amount of time? What difference do we see? Um, as an outside observer, you probably won't notice anything different. Um, but the training that NASA astronauts receive starts with basic training where they learn quite a bit about astronomics and, uh, and other uh, courses like that. And it goes on to give them uh, EVA training, extensive experience in, in the ISS systems and other systems they have to utilize and launch aboard. Um, and then, of, for, of course, they have to be able to maintain those systems. And so there's various degrees of experience that they gain. As a result of that, if you just did training straight as a professional astronaut, you train for about a year, and Joel could talk volumes about that. Our astronauts are trained for these particular missions. They're trained very specifically for the things they're going to do on orbit and the systems they'll utilize. Uh, and so that's what that focus is training on. The reason why we fly a professional astronaut like like Peggy in this case, they're the ones that help them when they come across things that they're not comfortable with or not sure about. And so we're able to let the, the private astronauts train a little differently and very focused on their mission uh, because we have a professional astronaut flying with them. So uh, hopefully that kind of lays it out for you, but to the to the observer, they'll, they'll look like uh, the rest of the astronauts in terms of the jobs they do on orbit and the interactions they have with the ground. Thank you, Mike Sofredini. We certainly agree with that on our side. For astronauts train uh, specifically for this mission, and then for longer duration missions, you're trained for those specific missions. So depending on the mission itself and the opportunity, you train the astronauts for whatever they're planning to do for that mission. So, uh, so to all of us, they are still astronauts and they're gonna be doing their job and they're going to 
fulfill the duties for this mission. John. Next, we're going to go to Joe Fisher from UPI United Press International. Um, Joe, your line is open. The question he submitted was for Angela. Can you elaborate on what you see a global space marketplace looking like and how soon does this become a broad reality? That's a, a great question. I think we can all envision something different, right? I mean, each of us has a different um, view of where we think we're going from that. Um, Mike has already mentioned uh, a lot about the lessons learned. That's why these private astronaut missions are so important to us because we on the NASA side is as Axiom is learning and, and refining their plans and processes on how to be successful in managing their own commercial space station someday and all the processes that it takes to train astronauts and bring them forward. NASA is also learning what it would be like to work hand in hand with a, a private astronaut and not with US government astronauts. And so as we take those lessons and we see also the commercial activities and the markets that are being um, brought into play, the new outreach um, efforts that are ongoing that NASA would not have been able to reach that are being reached by these different private astronauts, um, STEM and different um, charity researches and things that they want to do. We're expanding, expanding the scope of the people that are being touched by these missions. And I think you're going to start seeing that exponential as we keep doing this, right? We're learning a little bit on AX1. We'll learn more on AX2. It'll broaden even more. And as more and more people get involved, as all the different um, commercial entities that are trying to play in low Earth orbit start expanding that market, I think you're going to see an explosion that will equate into this marketplace. Now, the timeline of when that will actually happen is, is obviously we wish we had a crystal ball, but we are working very hard to enable that in any ways that we can. Private astronaut missions are one way, and we're looking at every day other ways that we can enable um, and break down barriers that will allow that for the future. And so our hope is to have um, operating commercial space stations um, by 2029. So we have do not have a gap between the ISS and these commercial stations. And so that is our goal. Our goal is to have a sustainable LEO economy by that time, at least in that small um, area. And then I think once that happens, you're going to see another explosion of opportunity as those um, space stations will be able to offer services and activities that would not be seen on a government platform. So um, 2029 is our goal for that micro economy, I, I would say, and then seeing that explode even beyond that in the next 10 years after that. Thank you so much, Angela. And just a reminder, if you have a question, you can use the chat. Um, you can use the chat or you can raise your hand. Um, please help us um, help you and put your name in the chat so we understand we know who we're calling on. Um, and the speakers in the room, please state your name before um, you speak so the um, everyone knows who's speaking and answering your questions. Okay, our next question comes from Sarwat Nasir from the National. Open. Hi, thanks for taking my uh, question. This one is for Michelle. Um, if you could uh, talk about what this mission means for Saudi Arabia and its space ambitions, and would this be the first of many missions for, for the kingdom? And what does it hope to achieve uh, You know, post the ISS era when it uh, is probably gonna retire by the end of this decade? Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. It's a memory over here. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're excited about this mission because it's an inaugural mission for our human spaceflight program. The human spaceflight program is intended to be sustainable, meaning that we have constant flow of astronauts going to do research to uh, help all humanity with research, uh, as well as enabling the, low, the sector within Saudi. How do we enable the sector within Saudi? By making local entities, whether research institutions, universities, uh, academia, students from uh, uh, schools to participate in developing novel science and novel experiments that can capitalize on these missions that are coming up in the future. Uh, and because it's sustainable, yes, we do have, um, we desire and we are, our goal is to have uh, long stay missions that will capitalize on that microgravity environment for a long duration, such as six months, uh, uh, you know, minimum of six months. 
So that's essentially what we would like to do for this human spaceflight program. It's supposed to be perpetual, sustainable, and in doing so, we will uh, train many astronauts. We will engage a lot of local entities to do a lot of research. We will enhance our partnerships with international research entities on collaborative work for microgravity research that what you know spans from human health all the way to um, physical science to um, in our case for this particular mission we even have an experiment that's supposed to analyze the concept of creating artificial rain in low gravity environments so the what we are hoping to achieve for this particular mission is obviously advancing science through these uh, break groundbreaking uh, microgravity research experiments and then uh, most importantly as well uh, try to engage the youth in Saudi through the 12 uh, like we're trying to reach 12,000 students across Saudi 47, 47 different locations to try to engage them plant the seed of curiosity to explore to have critical thinking uh, with these live events with the astronauts aboard ISS so that they do the same exact experiment on the ground while the astronaut is doing it in real time as they do the, the live event uh, in space and then they can juxtapose how their results are different and that will create that curiosity and that desire to understand like whoa what, how does this uh, why is this so different? I want to be the scientist of tomorrow. I want to be the astronaut of tomorrow. I want to be the scientist that creates a new experiment because this triggered me to create uh, an experiment that uh, essentially uh, takes the concept I learned from this experiment and expands on it. So these are the things we hope to achieve uh, in, in, to inspire the youth, to encourage our human capital to get excited about it, to join and become astronauts in the next mission, and to obviously grow the contributions to thank you thank you um, our next question comes from the houston business journal Vishnu Nair. um your line is open uh hi everyone um thank you so much for doing this um this is just new Nair with the houston business journal um, and I kind of wanted to ask um, on that local front, um, can anyone speak about, you know, how this mission can have short and long-term effects on Houston's space economy uh, going forward, and as well as maybe give an update on, you know, Axiom Space's operations here in Houston? Well, let's see. Well, we've talked a little bit about it. For us, the and in, in uh, Houston, we have uh, these missions really lead to ultimately uh, a low Earth orbit economy. That's the that's the bottom line uh, for us, and we do that, of course, as we've talked about today. Flying these missions is a precursor to um, flying our own space station and and helping grow the low Earth orbit economy between ourselves and the International Space Station, and ultimately transitioning what's going on on orbit to our space station when ISS is ready to retire. And so as a result of that, the local economy is affected significantly because we are not only the obvious part is jobs, but the amount of research and manufacturing that will take place over time, we suspect, will start to focus itself uh, around the Houston area as well, because there's a lot of testing and demonstration you have to do before you fly. Um, a, a system for producing a product, whatever that product might be. So we do see quite a bit of growth uh, around uh, Axiom uh, facilities as we start to fly more and more uh, manufacturers in particular, uh, not so much researchers, but manufacturers in particular, we think that's going to, you're going to see a lot of growth here. Uh, of course, the Axiom itself is located in, in uh, three uh, facilities. Um, we currently reside in what was the old Axiom, uh, Axiom, the old Fry's facility electronics store, which is an awesome place, by the way, you got to come visit it if you ever can. Um, and that's where we house uh, our engineering and all of our, our engineers and all the test uh, labs for uh, building our space station. We also reside in another facility in the Clear Lake area on the 600 Gemini, where our, our uh, spacesuit manufacturing team is busy building and testing uh, the suits for uh, both for use on the lunar surface uh, for NASA, but also use in low Earth orbit. And then we have our final facility is here on on uh, on Hercules, 
uh, I'll call it our, our headquarters building. Ultimately, we'll move out to Ellington Field where we um, have uh, about a 22 acre tract of land and we're building today. Our high bays and manufacturing facilities are out there and they, they are back to be completed here in about a month. So that's kind of the, the big picture view of um, Axiom and its footprint here in Houston. Um, this is Angela Hart. I'd like to add that on, on top of everything that um, Mike has mentioned, which is extensive, um, there are lots of other companies trying to get involved in this market as well. And Johnson Space Center is doing a lot to encourage that and enable that along the, along the center, um, both within the arena of what Axiom is doing and what other um, providers and partners that we have are, are looking to provide as well. We're trying to open up resources that Johnson Space Center has in order to enable these companies, um, both that including technical expertise, use of our facilities, and so just to help drive and thrive that Houston economy, economy and the area around Johnson Space Center that has been so supportive of us all these years. So I think you're going to see that as well. Um, a lot of the companies that are supporting the International Space Station are brought, broadening out into these other areas as well. And so um, the work that Axiom is doing and others is, is providing these opportunities. And I think you'll see more and more of that in the Houston area. Thank you so much, Mike and Angela. If you have a question, please use your hand um, and we'll enter the queue or you can submit the question. Uh, we had one more question, Angela. It was um, also for the Houston Business Journal. Can you discuss what AX2 will try and learn about with commercial breakthroughs in LEO? I know you might, you can answer this. I know our Axiom Space team will also want to chime in. Yeah, and I mentioned, this is Angela, I, I mentioned a little bit in the earlier question. Um, it goes across the gamut for us on what we're learning um, coming out of AX2. Um, we're learning different ways um, to work with commercial industry. We're, we're learning what commercial industry thinks is important, what their markets are that are important to them, um, how they think that they will move forward in the future and what types of things they need from NASA to help enable them to go forward. Um, we're also learning um, what, what it will be like, as we mentioned, to work hand in hand with potentially different missions and objectives. Um, as we move forward into different commercial um, destinations. And so that lessons learned process that was already mentioned a couple times is super important to all of us. Um, we're learning different markets in terms of outreach. Um, and so all of these, um, along with some of the great, um, and I'm gonna let Mike talk about them, but the technology demonstrations, applied science that are being done, that are thinking about new ways of how you would operate a space station um, that are different from the way we do it on ISS. I mean, in some ways, you know, we are a government institution that um, has a budget. And so if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? But they can now think of new innovative ways to go do things that we may not have the opportunity to do. And as I look at the portfolio of things that they are doing and or want to do in the future, there's some really exciting things that I could see that they would like to try out on future um, destinations that would be really cool that I'd love to talk about, but is it my place? <laughs> no. <laughs> Let's see, I will I will uh, comment to that part of it, though. The, the International Space Station is a fantastic spacecraft, um, and it was it was a sight to behold when it was assembled and, and it all went together the first time. Um, it's, it was designed started back in the 70s, and so it's it's its engineering was based on what we knew at the time and and what we knew we had to do. But Perhaps more importantly, the International Space Station has taught us a lot about what we really have to do to be safe in space and perhaps things we don't have to do to be safe in space. So as Angela said, we're benefiting from all of that. We get to start from a clean sheet of paper. And so we have done that and, and it's allowed us to build a, a what we think is a very capable a spacecraft for, for a reasonable operating, ultimately a reasonable operating cost uh, as well. And so it's not so much that space station is not as good as the current technology as much as it is informed. Everything we do is based on learning from the generations before us. Uh, the old adage is standing on the shoulders of giants, but it really is true. Every bit that's been learned starting back in the Mercury days is informed what we do. The fact that we do it a little bit differently or we don't do the same thing is not 
because it was bad. It was because we it taught us what we really had to do and what we didn't really have to do. And that's different in a spacecraft that goes around in circles in orbit and a spacecraft that's a launch vehicle and a spacecraft that has to land on another body. So it all is, we are all learning from this and we just have the advantage of, of when you start from scratch, you get all that information up front so you can build a different spacecraft that hopefully is more efficient and, and perhaps even safer than the ones we're using today. So. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, we have, um, we're gonna be wrapping up soon, so we can take two more questions. Um, our next question is David Curley. David, your line is open. Okay. Next, we'll go to Lenka White. Lenka, your line is open. Hi, thank you so much, Lenka White from Sputnik News. Uh, to the Axiom team, can you share, please, on what basis you decide uh, with which governments you cooperate? Now it is Saudi Arabia, but I also read about your agreement with Turkey and possible cooperation with Hungary. Thank you. Well, we're a global provider. We're a U.S. company for sure, but we're a global provider of, um, of services. So. Um, we're a bit agnostic. I mean, there are laws that we have to follow, so uh, we pay very close attention to those. And of course, there's technology transfer things we have to be very sensitive to. But we we uh, we intend to globe to, to service a global marketplace, and you see that. Uh, of course, Saudi Arabia is, is very important to us. Uh, UAE is on orbit today uh, as a flight that was uh, arranged for by Axiom Space. Uh, we are talking and, and have signed an agreement with Turkey for a flight. We've signed an agreement with Italy for a flight. We're have signed an agreement with Hungary. Uh, we're about to add two more uh, countries to that list. So uh, we are making progress in, in that realm. And we think it's very important um, that we have the largest community of countries that explore beyond low Earth orbit. And, and you start by cooperating together in, in low Earth orbit. So. We think what we're doing is not only serving a market, but more importantly, it's helping us as a species learn to live off the planet, which is going to be very important for us. Thank you. And our last question comes from Manuel Manzanati. Manuel? Manuel? Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. So sorry, thank you, Bettina. Uh, a question for Mr. Sufredini, and I apologize in advance if you mentioned this before. Could you give us a, a, a status of the construction of the first model of the station and how are the, the, the time frame, uh, how, how it's coming? Thank you. Yes, the uh, the systems are being designed and assembled here in Houston. Uh, and the uh, module, of course, the shell is being built by Tazi Alinea Space in Torino, Italy. Um, the module is, uh, the, the main pieces of the module are together, both for the first module and the second module. Uh, the first module is the main sections are now being uh, welded together and we expect delivery uh, early next year. Um, the a delivery early next then year then supports a, a launch of the first module in late uh, 2025. And uh, the subsequent modules, at least the next two modules will go up uh, as quickly as we can, which is uh, be 26 for the um, for the second module and 26 or 27 for the third module. Um, and then we'll stay in that configuration till about a year before uh, ISS retires and we'll bring up our a relatively large power and cooling module uh, and ring it out uh, before uh, before we separate from ISS. So that'll be based on when ISS uh, retirement date is. Well, thank you so much, Mike, and the entire team here. We really appreciate everyone for joining us today. That was our last question. Um, if we didn't get to your question, please email us at media at axiomspace.com and we'll try to get back to you as soon as possible.
Our next media opportunity is next week, Tuesday, April 11th, for our Science on the Mission press conference. We will be discussing in depth the science that we'll be conducting. We talked a little bit about it today. We're excited about that opportunity. Please visit axiospace.com for details on the press conference, new edition of photos and video um, on our press kit, and more details about the mission. Thank you so much, and go AX2. Record.